Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Hegel's famous dialectic of master and slave that we find in the self-consciousness portion of his great work, The Phenomenology of Spirit, um, Hegel first sketches out the position of the master, what it is that is going on on the side of the master, what, what he or she is attempting to attain, and how that connects with the, not just the slave, but also the world of things. Um, there's a lot of, of, of uh, mediations occurring, a lot of connections in just these three short paragraphs, 190 to 192. And if we think about where the, the Lord or Master came from, Hegel says that originally there's some sort of struggle to the death, right, to self-consciousnesses. And the slave gives in because they're too attached to their bare life and the, the, the Lord or master then takes over. Now, we, we could imagine, as indeed many other commentators have, um, situations that are not quite so primal as that, where one person is the, in the up position and the other person is forced into the down position throughout culture, history, time, um, you know, extending into the future. Um, that's all interesting. What we want to do here is look exactly at what Hegel is sketching out and then see if we can apply it in those sort of cases. So he starts out by talking about the Lord as being a consciousness that exists for itself. And he says, something has been achieved here, something stable. He says, it's a consciousness existing for itself, mediated with itself through another consciousness, through the consciousness not of other masters, but of the slave. The Lord knows who and what he or she is precisely by the existence and the activity of the slave. And that is an activity that is not just, you know, the slave doing something for the master in a pure isolated dyad. Rather, the slave is connected with the entire world of things. This could be as trivial as the slave is the one who always has to make coffee and bring the coffee in and get the order right about how many creamers and sugars go in it and make sure that the you know wooden stick is there or a spoon if you prefer that instead or you know things as elaborate as you know uh, vast caste systems with clearly defined um, you know, you're working on this, you're working on this, you're working on this, and you're never going to get out of that, and everything in between. So Hegel says that the Lord puts himself into relation with both of these moments, the, the um, other consciousness and to the thinghood in general. So the, the Lord or master puts him or herself in relation to the world of things through desire. We have desire for all sorts of things. Desire, begirda, is something that's basic to self-consciousness for Hegel. And, and much of that desire is for things like eating and drinking and enjoying creature comforts of all sorts and building things and you know going from place to place. All of these can fit into that. And the Lord or the Master is the one who's enabled to do that. Why? Because it's not just their own work Indeed, it's not going to be any of their own work in a moment that is accomplishing it, but the work of the slave. The slave is set to labor on the independent world. So, I mean, just consider for an example 
this book itself, how many different processes, and for us, industrial processes, he had to go into f- making this. Forget about having you know Hegel write it. Just think about the sheer uh, sets of activities and how many people were involved in creating the paper, let alone the binding and the ink that, that's involved, and then typesetting it. All of that is, is somebody working on the external world. The Lord doesn't really do much of that. That's what's nice about being the Lord or the master. You make other people do all that, that as we call grunt work, you know, the, the work for the peons, um, you know, whatever other ways we want to talk about it. You know, in our own day, we might say that the Lord could be in, you know, a corporation. They're the people who say, I'm an ideas person. I don't actually do all the work involved. I come up with the ideas and then all of you do it, you know, nowadays, largely through subcontractors. So Hegel says that this, this master puts himself in relation with the thing as such through desire and the consciousness, the consciousness of the slave. So the slave has an interesting, uh, you know, duality here. On the one hand, the slave has to be a consciousness or else they can't be a slave. On the other hand, they're being treated also as a thing, a thing that works on other things. So Hegel goes on and he says um, that, you know, there's a mediation that, that's occurring uh, in this case. The Lord is able to have the desires for this world of things met by the slave engaging in labor. The slave has to subject him or herself to the independent world. It's not a lot of fun. And they work upon things. And by working upon things, they transform them into then products, which can be enjoyed by the Lord. Hegel will tell us in this section that the Lord takes the dependent aspect of the thing and enjoys it and consumes it. Whereas the slave takes the independent aspect, the part that resists us, the part that makes us have to work at it, the part that requires us to subordinate ourselves, to get up at certain times, to you know, work our fingers to the bones, uh, make our hands bleed, all, all these sorts of things. So the Lord gets what seems to be the good part of the product, of the thing, right? And the slave gets the crappy part, the part that people don't want to have. At the very same time, something else is going on here. Because the desire that the Lord has is not simply for having a cushy life, you know, filled with, as we said, lots of creature comforts. And as we say, sitting on our laurels, right? The Lord, or Master is also interested even more in another kind of desire, desire for recognition, honor canon in Hegel's German, from the slave. And he attains this recognition in part by being over the slave and making the slave satisfy his or her desires, giving them the things, taking the, the, the best parts of it for him or herself. So um, why does the Lord get to do this? Hegel tells us, well, the Lord is the power over the thing. He proved in the struggle to the death that he, it is something mere, you know, merely negative. Um, he has power over this thing and power over the other person. And he holds the other in subjection. Um, now, if we go on, um, Hegel tells us that in, he says, in both of these moments, the Lord achieves his recognition through another consciousness. The other consciousness is expressly something unessential. This is going to lead us to another paradox, both by working on the thing and by its dependence on a specific existence. In neither case can it be Lord over the being of the thing and achieve absolute negation of it. The slave is in a doubly bad condition. 
On the one hand, the slave uh, is subjected to the independent world of objects that he or she has to work on that the Lord or master doesn't want to hear about. They, they're not interested in you know, how many hours the slave needs to work in order to make this happen or in the you know, craftsman-like or perhaps later industrial processes, except insofar as the Lord decides to be concerned with that. Maybe if they want to manage their estate well. The slave is kind of in a lonely position on his or her own, working in a world of objects that he or she is set to transform, which resist him or her. At the same time, there's, there's another thing. The slave is dependent upon the Lord for, or the master, for their very existence. And their existence sucks. It's not a good existence. It's a totally dependent one down position to be in, as we say. So Hegel talks about this as leading to, to uh, an interesting dynamic. He says, um, the, Lord, the master's essential nature is to exist only for himself. He's the sheer negative power for whom the thing is nothing. He is the pure essential action in this relationship. That of the slave is impure and unessential. What does this do to recognition? Can you really get recognition in the sense that you're looking for it as the master from the slave? Hegel says, no. For, for recognition proper, the moment is lacking. What the Lord does to the other, he also does to himself. And uh, what the bondsman or slave does to himself, he should also do to the other. So Hegel says, the outcome of this is a recognition that is one-sided and unequal. The master is not able to attain the kind of recognition that he or she was actually desiring from the slave precisely because the slave is a slave and is set to work on all of these objects and is dependent upon the, the master for his or her life. So he says, in this recognition, um, the unessential consciousness is, is for the master the object, which constitutes the truth of his certainty of himself. But this object doesn't correspond to its notion. There's, there's a disconnect here between the reality and the ideal. And he says, the object in which the Lord has achieved his lordship has turned out to be something quite different from an independent consciousness. You can only get the recognition that you truly desire from another independent consciousness. The slave, however, is a dependent consciousness. So what is the outcome? Uh, what Hegel has been talking about is the Lord, you know, or the master having certainty of self through this recognition. Now he finds out that the truth of this certainty is that he's not really attaining it. The truth winds up being something perhaps painful. Now, of course, there's ways to, to get around this, you know, lose yourself in enjoyment, lose yourself in the sheer sense of power. But Hegel thinks that there's something actually empty and unfulfilled in the existence of the Lord. 